So good evening, everyone. Um, I see people are starting to join us. So I'm gonna um, give just a couple of minutes for our participants to be able to start um, loading on. I'm sure that we're all in the crazy throes of just after school ending and uh, on a workday evening. So we'll give a few minutes for people to finish joining. Okay, so um, I don't wanna to start too late, 7.02. I have just a couple of um, slides to introduce tonight. First of all, welcome everyone. I am Eileen Anderson. I'm director of the Sue and Bill Gross um, Stem Cell Research Center here at um, UCI. Um, and uh, I wanna start out by saying thank you for joining us this evening. We all have incredibly busy schedules right now, at least we do here in the center, but we're muddling through. So welcome to you, uh, those of you who've been able to make the time to be here today. And of course, a huge thank you to a number of people. First of all, our speaker who unfortunately we had to go to a virtual format tonight. She has um, some sickness brewing in her family, but thank you so much for making the time anyway, despite that to participate and stay on target with us. Of course, a big thank you um, to our UCI media colleagues um, joining us tonight is Kyle Good as our host and organizer, Judy Beck from the Stem Cell Research Center for Communications and um, Brian, who is still assisting um, as uh, Stem Cell Research Center Community Outreach Chair. So thanks to all of you for your time and for joining us. For the audience, um, you know, how can you help? Well, by participating, by being here um, to events that we have like this. Um, of course, we're always interested in doing some outreach about the great things that we do in the center, the exciting discoveries that people have. If you're interested in hearing about those things, please do contact us. We contact us, we'd be delighted to share with you um, the great progress that we're making here. And a person to reach out to is Amber Harness. Her email address is on this slide. A couple of words on format before we go ahead and get started. We're gonna keep it fairly streamlined tonight. We have just one speaker for you, but a really terrific one. Um, I just had a snap, snap preview of her slides and I think she's got a great story to tell, so that's exciting. But just as if we had our normal two speaker format, um, we're gonna have our speaker presentation followed by time for questions. If you put your questions in this virtual format into the Q&A box, um, we will answer them perhaps as they come in, but most likely since we just have Dr. Olabise um, uh, this evening, we're gonna hold those and I'll moderate a Q&A session at the end. So please feel free to add your questions though at any point during her talk this evening. And with that, I wanna do a little bit of an unusual introduction tonight. First, um, I wanna just again thank uh, Dr. Olabise for being here tonight, um, highlight a couple of things about her education and history. She has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from MIT, um, a master's in aeronautical and in mechanical engineering from University of Michigan at Ann Arbor, and her PhD in biomedical engineering from University of Wisconsin-Madison. We are super delighted to have her here at UCI in the Department of Biomedical Engineering as a quite senior assistant professor, um, getting ready for her next steps in terms of promotion. And I wanted to spend a couple of minutes tonight just chatting with her by way of introduction. Since again, we have the time to talk about how did she get down this path and how did we, um, how did she come to this pathway in terms of her work? So Ronke, if you would be willing to um, start your video and I'm going to stop my share so that we can see you a little bit larger. Um, again, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so sorry that um, your husband's not feeling well, send him our best and um, maybe that you're a little bit under the weather, but thank you for making the time to be here tonight. And um, let me just ask you to start, why, why engineering? How did you end up deciding going down that path as opposed to the, all the different sorts of things that, that you could have done? Well, so uh, ever since I can remember, I've always wanted to be an astronaut and I should not put that in the past tense, um, want to. <laughs> I've applied three times, uh, I've had three interviews, no, four times, three interviews. And so I've just always wanted to do that. And there are a lot of different ways 
to go about doing that. Um, some people go through the military, some people become physicians, some people become scientists, and some people become engineers. And I was the kid that took apart our phones and to try to figure them out. And I aligned most closely with engineering. Um, my dad is an engineer. And I think when I was a kid, though, I didn't understand what that meant. I thought it had something to do with trains as a kid. Um, but I picked MIT because it was the only school that had aerospace engineering. A lot of schools had aerospace engineering. And so I joined and I was declared major aerospace engineering. But I realized that what I liked more was like, I really liked design and there was this huge robot competition in mechanical engineering and with design for astrospace kinds of structures, you, you're optimizing for safety. So you're really limited. Uh, and also flight, safety flight has to make it into space. So you're limited in what you can do. Whereas if I'm trying to make a robot jump into a hole and deliver pink, ping pong balls. I could do anything. And so I switched into mechanical engineering and had a lot of fun designing things. Uh, and then I kind of missed aerospace engineering and I returned to it in my master's. And then I had a professor who, uh, we were in a composites class. It was a design of specific types of materials. And he said, I want you guys to design a material for a non-aerospace application. And I had no idea what to do, like none at all. And I just kept searching the web. And I saw this picture of this hip implant that had failed by pushing through um, the bone. And I just went down a rabbit hole. And one of the things in design that we have to do is we have to write these programs for optimization. And so if you have a structure and it's being compressed by two forces, you write a code that will optimize the minimum weight of that structure and how, how to make it the strongest. And the more I researched about bone, the more I found that bone did this by itself. Like bone was better than any optimization code that we could write. And I just kind of fell in love with bone. And I was heading down a path where I would be doing bone in an aerospace department. And I figured it probably would be better to go to a biomedical engineering department. And I guess that's and pretty are. much. Yeah. Okay. Can I just tell you that is the best story ever. I am so glad that I asked this question this evening. And we have some weird points of intersection because I am a totally failed aeronautical engineer. Um, from my undergraduate major, because I came to the realization very early on, despite my passion in high school to be an astronaut like yourself, um, that aeronautical engineering was not going to work for me because I was just plain bad at it. Um, and so I jumped over to biomedical engineering and then found a neuroscience class at the very end. And that's how I got set off on, on my passion. So I think um, it's such a powerful story you tell. I was just doing an interview for this um, program uh, called Find Your Grind. That's an outreach to um, high school students today. Um, and their whole game is to do interviews and show high school students really diverse paths, like different ways that you can end up in a career. So your, your backstory on that just totally resonates. I think it's fantastic. Um, so now that you are at this point in your life where you found out uh, that you have a passion for bone and what its amazing capacities are. Why stem cells? So um, that, again, I kind of feel like I stumble into things. So I had developed this method to use cells to grow bone. And so the, for, my, for my PhD work, I um, investigated limb lengthening. So like... Um, the, my, my advisor was a pediatric orthopedic surgeon, and he was looking at outcomes in kids who have one, length, one leg that's longer than the other and how they can go about and elongate them. And so I was looking at different kinds of methods that they were using to help the soft tissue because the bone is awesome. It does really, really great. You can elongate it, but the soft tissue kind of doesn't like that. Um, and so 
from there, I wanted to continue in bone. And ultimately, the uh, person that I was going to be working under didn't get funding that was expected. And so um, she recommended me to someone who was doing bone tissue engineering. And so that was kind of a switch because I'm coming from this heavy mechanics background into a tissue engineering background. And um, they were using cells as these little bio factories to grow bones. And the immune system kept destroying the cells. And so um, I came up with this method, and I'll talk about it more later, to protect these cells. And um, when I was working as a professor, like a brand new professor, you know, you do a lot of reading and you try to stay current. And um, I stumbled on the fact that um, mesenchymal stem cells, because we had used mesenchymal stem cells to make bone, and I stumbled on the fact that they were good in wound healing. And I thought, wait a second, you know, maybe the way that I delivered them to make bone would also work to heal wounds. And so then we started to explore that and we came up with several kind of exciting findings um, that, you know, I'll talk about more today. But it was uh, kind of really just by going to a talk and seeing somebody talking about it and uh, wondering, oh, this thing that I use for bone, um, will this work also in this situation? And it did. So I don't think I could make a more perfect introduction to your talk that we just previewed if I tried. So I'm going to um, show you mercy and not ask you what your favorite shoe color is like Peter Wood right now um, and let you just go ahead and go on to your talk because it's just a beautiful segue. So thank you so much for sharing that. And if you could go ahead and share your screen. Um, a reminder again to the audience, please go ahead and put your questions into the Q&A at any point, and we'll be compiling those to be able to do some moderate question, moderated questions at the end. And with that, please go ahead. Okay, so what I tend to do, I'm going to stop my video just for the talk so that it gives my, uh, so that it doesn't hang, um, but I'm still here. Okay, so before... I jump right into my research. I want to discuss a little bit of the motivation. And, you know, unless you go through life in bubble wrap, you've probably had an injury like a paper cut or a skinned knee or maybe even something more serious that requires stitches. When everything goes well, you heal within a couple of weeks. But when things go wrong, the impact can be devastating to your quality of life. Uh, in fact, one uh, VA, Veterans Administration Hospital, they reported that 70% of the amputations that it had to conduct were due to faulty wound healing. And while this image doesn't show all the types of wounds susceptible to faulty wound healing, it captures a good portion that are still challenging. Eloids are an overgrowth of scar tissue. Uh, they're usually larger than the original wound. They occur in all people but they occur most frequently in people with darker skin. Hypertrophic scars are also raised scars, but while keloids typically extend beyond the wound, hypertrophic scars do not. They're raised, but they stay within the area of the wound. They happen within one to two months of the injury, and they usually regress over time, while keloids can develop months to years after injury, and they'll never regress without uh, treatment. And so also hypertrophic scars tend to happen after surgical incisions, um, largely after burns. Up to 22% of surgical wounds will become infected and they tend to cost 20% of all of the cost of, of complicated wounds. And in burns, of all burn deaths, 75% of the deaths are due to wound infection prior to healing. And because when the wound is open, the longer it's open, the longer uh, the, the chance of infection. And so what I chose to focus on uh, is chronic wounds. And I actually think that my uh, system could help all of these types of wounds, but you have to look at one at a time. Um, so chronic wounds, occur more and more, they're, they're on the rise because these populations are most susceptible to chronic wounds 
and people are living longer, so there's more elderly people. Um, there's a worldwide uh, rise in obesity, and nothing that we are doing is combating it. So um, it, it's it's also a large population that are affected by chronic wounds. Uh, diabetes is also on the rise, and uh, over uh, one and a half million diabetics will develop a chronic wound. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. And so, in general, like people just think of their skin as their skin, but skin acts as this protective layer. And when it's injured, that can affect its structural and functional integrity. And the body has this coordinated process to repair it because it's so important. And so after injury, what happens is what we call a wound healing cascade. And it's activated, and this cascade involves the following stages. First is called hemostasis. It's not on this picture, but it's just when the body stops the bleeding by causing clotting. And then comes inflammation. And that's when the body makes your blood vessels a little more porous so that immune cells can more easily exit the bloodstream and enter the damaged tissue and fight any foreign invaders that are there and clean up dead tissue. But because the blood vessels are more porous, fluids will leak into the area as well. And that's why inflammation often comes with swelling. And next comes proliferation. And that's when the cells that make up that tissue, they proliferate, so they, they uh, multiply and they replace the lost tissue. And finally is remodeling where the scar slowly changes over time. And this is a very simplified version of what's happening. My explanation is very simplified. So if this is your area of specialty, forgive me. But for the purposes of understanding normal wound healing, this is the basic gist of it. Uh, chronic wounds are characterized by having a prolonged inflammatory response. They're stuck right here. And in many cases, it affects not only the epidermis, which is the top layer of skin, but also affects the dermis, which is immediately under the epidermis. But it can also affect the muscle and bone. And the wound will never progress beyond inflammation. It will not heal, and it can often smell. And there are actually cases where people have had an open wound for over 30 years, and sufferers of chronic wounds are often self-conscious about these wounds because they know that they smell. And so... Chronic wounds affect more than 6 million people in the United States alone, and it costs the U.S. health care system about $25 billion per year. Uh, diabetic foot ulcers, they're really a devastating subset of chronic wounds, and they're a significant cause of morbidity and mortality in diabetic patients. Uh, the ulcers will have a high glucose wound environment, and they often get infected because they stay open so long and that will lead to chronic inflammation. And they estimate that of all diabetics, 25% will develop a foot ulcer in their lifetime. And the dangers of this type of chronic wound are that the longer the wound is open, the more likely it will lead to infection, which in turn will lead to longer hospital stays. It can lead to loss of function. It can lead to amputation. It can lead to death. Um, the incidence of chronic wounds is increasing, like I said, because diabetics, the obese, and the elderly are more susceptible to these chronic wounds, and their numbers are on the rise. So pressure sores are a type of chronic wound caused by immobility, and they tend to occur in areas with little fat, like over the bone here, and little fat, little muscle over these bony prominences. And so it'll be over here, it might be on the side of the hip. Current therapies to treat these wounds include cleaning the wound and applying um, daily dressings, daily dressing changes in hopes that it will heal. There are other approaches. Um, it includes debreeding the wound of devitalized tissue. Um, debreeding is a surgical procedure where the dead tissue is scraped away until the tissue begins to bleed again because you know it's not alive until it bleeds. Um, another treatment is hyperbaric oxygen therapy where high pressure is intended to force oxygen into the wound. And there's also negative pressure wound therapy, which applies a tension on the wound site that drains the wound exudate, which is just the, the juice coming out of the wound, while keeping the wound moist. And so this is thought to induce histogenesis, which, which is a growth of tissue in response to tension. And I'm certain you've seen examples of histogenesis if you've ever seen anybody with... Um, uh, an earring expander, and so it goes from a small hole to a large hole without ripping through the, the earlobe, 
And so that is an example of histogenesis. The earlobe is growing under that force. And so there's also alternative approaches. They involve stimulation, like acoustic waves. Um, these are thought to stimulate the cells that are needed for wound healing, but who are like being lazy on the job. They're not arriving at the site. And other alternative approaches involve treatments like applying medical magnets. Maggots, I'm sorry, I said magnets. Medical maggots. Uh, they only eat the dead tissue and they can more efficiently debride the wound than a surgical knife can. I opted not to include pictures of them at work in a wound because they are highly disgusting. Um, honey also has a high sugar content and microbial life cannot survive within it because it's so high. And that's why when they find mummies and, and there's honey, it can still be edible because uh, microbes don't cause it to rot. It keeps the wound moist. It naturally sloughs off dead tissues. And then also insulin creams have been shown to accelerate wound healing, even in non-diabetic patients. And I had only known about insulin as a regulator of blood glucose. And at the time, I had not known that insulin was also a powerful wound healing agent. And the more I began to research it, the more I saw that the problem was with delivery. And, and in other words, patients had to apply insulin daily. They had to open up the wound uh, dressing, put the insulin on, close it, and every time you open something up, it's susceptible to infection. Um, when researchers tried reservoir systems where the insulin is entrapped in a biomaterial and delivered over weeks, um, what they found is like the half-life of the insulin is relatively short, that's why you keep it in the fridge, the reservoir delivery systems would show decreased bioactivity over time. In studies where researchers tried to use biomaterials to deliver insulin at a constant rate where the insulin was crystallized so it wouldn't um, degrade, they had problems where the biomaterial would degrade too fast or too slowly, um, causing like a burst release or just too little insulin to be delivered. And so that's when we considered that the best agent to deliver insulin might be cells. And so this is kind of showing cells inside um, a microsphere. Uh, the cells wouldn't have this problem of the biomaterials with um, variable delivery. They would deliver a constant fresh supply of insulin. And I had developed this new method to microencapsulate cells. And the best way to deliver cells without using immune suppressants is by microencapsulating them. And the benefits are that they're localized, they're protected from the immune system. It can't get at them. Um, the size of the microspheres are within the diffusion limits of oxygen and nutrients. So there's ready nutrient waste exchange and the insulin can pass freely out of these microspheres. And so we really focused on using insulin secreting cells to serve as biofactories of our insulin. And so a great way to think of this is if you think of this microsphere as like jello and you think of these insulin secreting cells as grapes and the immune responders are little ants that are trying to get at these grapes, they can't get at the grapes until they get through that jello first, right? And that jello that we have made is impervious to it. So that's a good way to think of it. And so we encapsulated the insulin secreting cells into a synthetic biomaterial, and this is an actual picture of them. And this image is smaller than the width of a human hair. Um, and our biomaterial is called polyethylene glycol diacrylate, or PEG-DA. PEG-DA forms hydrogels that they do look a lot like jello, but jello is hydrophobic. And that means like when you have it in the fridge, you see water on top of it with a hydrophilic gel, you would never see water on top of it because it would absorb it. It's like a huge sponge. Um, they absorb up to 700 times their volume in water. And this means that in a moist wound, they would absorb the fluid that would keep the cells alive and then secrete insulin into the wound. And we, we, we achieved this microencapsulation by using photopolymerization. And so first we combine the cells in the hydrogel prepolymer. And uh, then we place this combination into a mineral oil containing these photoinitiators. And the photoinitiators turn the liquid hydrogel into a solid hydrogel when exposed to uh, photons or, or light. 
And so then we vortex to achieve this vortex induced mineral oil emulsion under white light. And that will cross link these micro droplets into solid um, microspheres. And so this is what we've got. We've got this aqueous phase with our um, hydrogel in our cells and our mineral oil phase. And then we isolate these cross links microspheres from oil by centrifuging them. And uh, we micro encapsulated two different types of cells. Um, they were both insulin secreting cells. One released insulin in a constant manner and uh, one that released it in a glucose dependent manner. So if there was no glucose present, it wouldn't release any insulin. The other one just kept pumping it out. Um, this is the glucose dependent cell type. Uh, this was the cover of tissue engineering part A because I think it's very pretty. Um, the red cells are dead and the live are green. And so this is after about a week. And so we tested how long they lived and we tested how um, much insulin they released. And you really only needed about 50% alive before you started to see a drop off in insulin release. And so then we applied these microencapsulated cells to a one by one centimeter diabetic wound and we followed how quickly that wound would heal. And so for lay audiences, I try not to show images of actual wounds in case some might find it disturbing, but um, these are outlines of the wound. Um, this is day zero and this is day 28. And we found so that the constant insulin secreting wounds, these are constant and these are um, glucose dependent. They accelerated that wound closure faster than control. Um, all wounds were closed by day 28. Uh, but with the glucose dependent insulin secreting cells, 90% of the wounds were closed by day 28. And that was not significantly different than control. And control wounds took over 35 days to heal. And so um, now I'm going to jump into the mesenchymal stem cells and why we chose. So it was exciting. We showed that insulin secreting cells could accelerate wound healing. Our next step was in, to incorporate mesenchymal stem cells. So if you're unfamiliar with the difference between embryonic stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells, here's a little overview. And so embryonic stem cells, they can keep growing in a petri dish. They self-renew and they can become any cell in the body. And so if you think about this like a special power, it's like Star Trek's Odo becoming a top. He can become anything. So can embryonic stem cells. Mesenchymal stem cells, on the other hand, they can renew, um, they self-renew a limited amount. After a while, they will become senescent, meaning that you can't grow them in a petri dish anymore. They can't make any more copies of themselves or what we call daughter cells. They can become many cells in the body, but only cells are, which are related to the mesenchyme. And these are tissues like muscle, bone, and fat. And they also secrete factors that heal, they fight bacteria, they regulate certain aspects of the immune system. And if you also want to think about this like a superpower, unlike Odo, who can become literally anything, this top, um, uh, it's like more like Mystique from the X-Men. She can become any person. She can't become anything. So can actually Camilo from Encanto, if you're more familiar with that. And just like Encanto's Julieta can heal with food that she gives the injured, mesenchymal stem cells can heal by releasing factors. So mesenchymal stem cells are like feeding the wound and healing the wound. And so mesenchymal stem cells have these superpowers and we wanted to use them. And so they're also, when people say adult stem cells, they're generally talking about mesenchymal stem cells. And mesenchymal stem cells have also been shown to uh, assist in wound healing, just like the insulin secreting cells. And donor mesenchymal stem cells, they can assist in wound healing by secreting these chemokines and cytokines, which are like Julius's food. They're these soluble biofactors. They exert angiogenic, um, which means that they cause blood vessels to grow, and they exert anti-inflammatory effects, which means that, you know, if you have a wound that's stuck in the inflammation stage, it can help kickstart it to get out of that stage. They increase collagen synthesis, which is needed to rebuild the skin, and they stimulate macrophage and fibroblast migration. And these are cells that are important in the proliferation phase of wound healing. And uh, finally, they differentiate into some of the tissues that are needed. And so, like, 
if if we're looking at this, this is our mesenchymal stem cell, I can grow it in my Petri dish, and then I can apply it to this one. So let's do that. So I'm applying it to the one, and it's doing all of these wonderful things. It's using its special powers, and bam, it heals that wound. Okay, so that's the intended outcome of using the zinc stem cell. Although that's the plan, what often happens is that the mesenchymal stem cells will get taken from their nice, comfy incubator where they're happy, and then they'll get placed into a wound with a different pH, a different oxygen level, a different temperature, and they'll just decide to die in that new environment. So they apoptose. Or when they're there, they'll crawl away in search of another wound to heal. And so they, they like to migrate. Sometimes um, they'll go because they receive a signal to go someplace else. And so what then results is that not enough mesenchymal stem cells are left to effectively heal that wound. So we knew that both mesenchymal stem cells and insulin affect every single stage of wound healing and both achieve this through different pathways. We wanted to see if we could combine these wound healing agents and get a better result. And since insulin creams would be toxic to mesenchymal stem cells, and our cell-based method meant we could encapsulate both cell types to deliver both insulin and mesenchymal stem cell factors, we decided to um, combine these and test them out. So we wanted to move away from microspheres to hydrogel sheets because these stayed in place directly over wounds while microspheres kind of rolled to the wound periphery. And so we wanted uh, good coverage. And so where we had in the microspheres, we just had the insulin secreting cells. In the hydrogel sheets, we combined the mesenchymal stem cells and the insulin secreting cells. And so the idea was that we would then place these hydrogels into wounds. Others have co-encapsulated these two cell types to treat diabetes, but nobody was trying it in wound healing. Um, the people who were doing it uh, for treating diabetes, they would put it inside the abdomen. They found that the insulin secreting cells were healthier in the presence of the mesenchymal stem cells, but they were not concerned with the fate of the mesenchymal stem cells because they were trying to treat diabetes. They care about the insulin. We cared about both cell types. And since insulin can also reduce the proteolytic degradation of growth factors, meaning the proteins that come along and are like, let's eat up these growth factors. We hypothesized that when we co-encapsulated insulin secreting cells and mesenchymal stem cells, that the mesenchymal stem cell factors would be protected and therefore be more effective. And by encapsulating the cells into a hydrogel, we knew that we could restrict the mesenchymal stem cells to the site of application so they wouldn't be able to crawl away. And we hypothesized that the two cells would synergistically heal wounds faster than either cell type could alone. Okay, and so we combined the cells into polyethylene glycol hydrogel sheets um, by combining the two cells with the polymer precursor, just like before, but instead of um, putting it in a vortex-induced emulsion, we injected it into glass molds and we photopolymerized with white light. And this image is uh, what we call a Z-stack. And so it's uh, passing through the thickness of the sheet with the same live dead viability staining. And what we wanna see is we wanna see more green than red because red is dead. And uh, as we pass through the thickness, we see there's good viability with no real hypoxic central, central areas. Because remember, the diffusion distance of um, oxygen is about 250 uh, micrometers. So if you have something sitting in fluid that is thicker than 500, because the fluid can come in on both sides, 250 plus 250 is 500, then you risk getting an area where the cells can't get any oxygen. Okay, so then we got to testing. These images show the viability of encapsulated cells over a period of 21 days. So the hydrogel sheets were one by one centimeter squared. And they were either 300 micrometers, 400 micrometers, or 500 micrometers. And, you know, again, 500 micrometers is about the width of four to five human hairs laid next to each other. And so we tested all of these um, with a low cell density, medium cell density, and high cell density. And what that means is that we shoved about a half a million cells 
into this hydrogel, 2 million cells into this hydrogel, and um, 5 million cells into the high density hydrogels. And um, the cells actually that were encapsulated in the 400 micrometer thick sheets showed the best viability, as did the cells that were encapsulated into um, the low uh, cell density. And so we opted to pick this one. And so before testing anything in an actual wound, there are several tests that can give us an idea of what candidates are better than others. And they're not the same as actually healing wounds, but we can grow keratinocytes, which are skin cells, and we can grow them in a Petri dish until they, con they form what's called a confluent layer. So it's just a layer of cells across, and then we'll scratch that layer, and that's what this gap is showing. And we can then measure the time it takes for the cells to grow back together. So this is the cells growing back together after they've been scratched. Um, and so if you grow them with different treatments, you can see which treatments cause them to close the scratch flat faster or slower. And they'll do this at a fairly consistent rate. Uh, some people don't really like the scratch assay because it's really not uh, representative of wound healing. But one thing that you can do with it is you can use it to select which treatment you're going to try with the wound healing. Uh, and so we tested with mesenchymal stem cells alone, insulin secreting cells alone, and the combination of insulin secreting cells and mesenchymal stem cells. And so instead of testing all 27 hydrogels, we used ratios and cell densities that were shown to release the most insulin or the most mesenchymal stem cell factors. And what we found was that, again, the lower cell density hydrogels outperformed the higher cell density hydrogels, and that an equal number of insulin secreting cells to mesenchymal stem cells, or a one-to-one -one ratio of co-encapsulated cells, outperformed all the other hydrogels. It outperformed the insulin secreting cells alone. It outperformed the mesenchymal stem cells alone. Okay, so then, we again repeated the wound study and we put it in these diabetic wounds. And when we tested it, we found that the combination, this is the combination, this is 14 days, it healed all wounds in 14 days. There was one wound that healed in 18 days. But so from 35 days to 14, right? This is the control. It's pretty much not changed at all. Um, this was faster than non-diabetic wounds. Non-diabetic wounds take 21 days to heal. So we were very excited about this, and our next steps are to test with burns because a lot of the conditions that cause slow wound healing in chronic diabetic wounds are similar to um, the conditions in burns. Burns also have a high glucose environment. Burns also are slow to heal. And so to summarize and conclude, um, we know that they're known to release protective factors that protect insulin secreting cells. Um, we also knew that mesenchymal stem cells often died upon transplantation, but we found that insulin secreting cells also were protecting the mesenchymal stem cells. And we also found that when the mesenchymal stem cells were stimulated by this insulin, they released a ton more factors and they lived longer than when the mesenchymal stem cells were by themselves. And so we believe that this is explaining the symbiotic relationship of the co-encapsulated cells that we saw where they healed even faster than controls, they, or not controls, where they healed even faster than non-diabetic wounds. And so with that, I would like to stop for questions. Uh, I would like to honor my lab. These are all the people who do all the work um, throughout the years. And I would like to thank everybody for their attention. Wow. So, Ronke, if I can ask you to um, stop your share so that we can see you close up and personal, that would be great. Awesome. Can I just tell you that was a fantastic seminar? So um, we have a couple of questions that have come in, and I think there'll probably be more once the dam breaks and we ask a couple. So let me start and just go in order a little bit. Um, so the first question is from Noah Husband, who, who puts in um, uh, a query basically I'm going to boil down and say, is there anything that is, you know, has the potential for toxicity in your formulation? So they ask about photo initiators and I, you know, I think the question there really is, do you get some sort of byproduct right out of, um, uh, creating your substrate, um, for lack of a better word, you'll have a better one, um, that you use in terms of your delivery method. Is there anything that you need to worry about from a, a toxicity or an adverse event point of view? 
So we had a pathologist look at it, and he said it was the most bioinert material he'd ever, ever seen. Um, there's nothing, there's no fibrosis around it. There's no, it really protects the cells well. And this was internal. This was in a different application when we were trying to uh, grow bone. Um, and we also found in controls where we use just the hydrogel by itself, those wounds healed better than saline controls with a bandage. Um, and I think, you know, everything demonstrates that you want to keep the wound environment moist, and generally the hydrogel will do that. But um, it's really like the, the, the photo initiators that we use are ESNY, which is really non-toxic, um, and uh, it's, it's used to, you can stain cells in the body with ESNY. It's, we haven't seen any kind of adverse reaction to the, the hydrogel. So that's awesome. So with that, I'll launch into um, the second question. Rick Robertson, who's actually a former faculty member here at, at UCI says superb presentation. Um, and I know for a fact that in the first year uh, medical histology, he used to teach epithelium as part of the game. So he's asking a skin question that's related to this. And so using your mesenchymal cells to facilitate healing makes great good sense. But he's wondering if you need to add on something to help the epithelial cells heal, or does that process just kick off by virtue of getting this deep wound healing response, but, you know, through your cell delivery or your patch delivery with the mesenchymal cells and the insulin? So we have this histology and it's really beautiful, but I didn't want to put it in because it's not published yet. And we're trying to put out the paper, but um, what we see is we start to see, it starts the, you know, the projections that you expect to see uh, start to come only with the, the dual cell therapy. So with the the MSC cell therapy doesn't really yet look like uninjured skin, whereas the mesenchymal stem cell therapy starts to. And what we what we found was that there was no, and we also had a pathologist look at these, there was no evidence of um, scab or scar formation. It looked like uninjured skin. And so um, we're continuing with the work, we're looking at um, doing uh, single cell studies, single cell sequencing, um, and, and looking more at the histology and the wound environment and looking to longer term of the wound remodeling to see whether or not they get um, hair follicles and things like that. And so, but so far it looks like like you get a very normal epithelium back. Yeah. So does that suggest, I'm just going to riff on that question for a second. Does that suggest, because you normally would have cues, right, between deeper tissues and epithelium, they're talking to one another. So if you, by virtue of this um, manipulation, are you getting a more normal set of signals that are going back and forth between those different cellular types? Is, and so that allows the epithelium to heal? That's what we think. And that's what we're trying to test. And so we think that what is happening is that the mesenchymal stem cells are getting really turned on by the insulin. And because when we, when we looked at mesenchymal stem cells by themselves, right, we got very low levels of VEGF, vascular and vesicular growth factor. We got very low levels of CGF beta, very low levels of everything. When we combine them, all of those levels shot up. And so what we think is that it's like activating, that they've been primed and um, that these cells have been primed, the ankle stem cells have been primed, so that once we place them on the wound, whatever factors that coordinate this, you know, and again, we're doing studies to figure out why, but we're hypothesizing that it's the PI3K ACT pathway that's been just kicked on in these mesenchymal stem cells and that that is causing the wonderful delivery. Awesome communication. Yep. So then uh, there's a couple of granular um, questions here uh, about the cell density that you're using and why keratinocytes instead of like skin fibroblasts, which might be, you know, closer to your animal model. And so you expect them to behave the same way, I guess. So when we first did the studies, again, I was coming from bone. And um, I had a mentor helping me. And when I first did the studies, I had no idea about anything to do with wound healing. And we just copied their model. So that's the honest answer. 
So they were using keratinocytes, so we use keratinocytes. But we are planning on looking at um, fibroblasts as well, but we haven't yet. Right. Okay. Um, parallel question. Wow, you have a flood of questions coming in now. Mm -hmm. So um, vitamin A, which I didn't know, also apparently promotes wound healing. Do you think that that would be an alternative to insulin. Are there any advantages that you know of offhand you may or may not for insulin relative to vitamin A or might they work by kind of a, you know, an analogous mechanism? So I actually had, um, so I teach this class where I have undergrads who've never done research before and they did, they didn't do full wound healing studies. They did scratch assay um, studies with vit different vitamins to test the effect of different vitamins. And they did see the vitamin A um, closed the scratch assays fastest, but nothing seemed to work as fast as the insulin secreting and mesenchymal stem cell combination. And so we just didn't pursue that. Uh, so I can't really comment on it because we were, we were just narrowing in on what seemed to be the best. Um, but yes, they saw that it accelerated it, but they we didn't see that anything did it like this combination did. To this level, right. So um, I think you alluded to this in your comments, maybe as we were asking questions or, or right at the end of your talk um, in terms of other ongoing work. So um, superficial wounds are a huge deal. I mean, I work in spinal cord injury, right? And the incidence of pressure sores is really, really high. This is a huge medical complication. And as you highlighted, um, which probably a lot of people don't realize, a really expensive one in terms of medical care and costs and morbidity, mortality, right? Huge risks that go with that. But um, beyond skin and superficial wounds, you might have sort of long-term consequences to internal organs, right? In terms of wound healing as a result of surgeries or you know, lesions from blunt trauma or different, different sorts of things that go wrong, right? In the body. Is there a potential application that is, you, know, you can pivot to and think about those other indications as well? So what we've focused on, we've focused on things where, so our, our feeling is the, the rationale for this was that insulin helps chronic wounds, mesenchymal stem cells help chronic wounds. We hypothesized that it'll help both, right? Um, that together it'll help better. That was the hypothesis. Um, <coughs> so we've done some pilot studies and burns because of the same reason, and we saw the same uh, positive effect. And so the, the targets are things for which it has been demonstrated that mesenchymal stem cells help. Because we think if, if it's the mesenchymal stem cells that are dominating this wound healing effect, and if it's just that they are being primed by our treatment, then um, this treatment will work in other areas. And so one of the things um, is like radiation dermatitis. Um, mesenchymal stem cells seem to help with uh, radiation burns. They seem to help with um, a, a wide swath of things. I think my image is frozen, but yes, but we can still hear you. Your audio is good. So oh, there, he's back. Are you hearing feedback? Nope, you're perfect. Continue on. You're good. Yeah. And so, um, yes. Uh, I, I'm interested in looking at uh, repairing um, muscle kinds of injuries and things like that. Mostly, I'm interested in, you know, tissues derived from the mesenchyme, like for obvious reasons. Um, but um, so far, we're, we're looking at um, just right now skin and, and muscle. But I can be looking at other. Down the road. Yeah, of course. So um, I'm going to switch over. There were a couple of questions that got relayed um, in the chat um, from YouTube. And one of those is um, if you have um, if you have an old surgery where you have a scar that's formed, maybe you know you alluded to some of these examples in terms of the images you showed at the beginning of your talk, is 
is it possible if you can't see a clear margin, this is clearly somebody who's on the technical side of the game, um, to be able to excise that old scar and would you have to excise, you know, all the way out to the margins in order to be able to think about applying your biomaterial plus cells plus insulin in order to improve what the wound healing of that original scar was? So I would think yes. Um, I would think that you would need to redo the whole um, healing process. And so, um, yeah, we, di we didn't see scars. Um, and so we were very excited by that. And we want to test that further. Um, <clears throat> but I would think that you would have to excise the whole. Um, and this will not work in ischemic wounds, um, unfortunately. Uh, it, it needs to be moist because the cells rely on that exudate to, to live. And so whatever excision has to be weeping a little bit. Um, and so, but when it, it, it's just been, it's just been amazing. Yeah. So that's an interesting point though, right? That the wound environment is going to influence certainly in terms of your cell survival. Um, and I guess it, it kind of leads me to jump over to a different question that we have along that environment part of things. Of course, that's, you know, in the CNS, that's a part of where my research lies. We have a, a lot of people at the center who think from that point of view. The question that's been asked is, would you expect your hydrogel plus cells plus insulin secreting cells or whatever combination to be influenced by that wound environment. So as you just mentioned, right, an ischemic environment from a survival perspective isn't going to work. But would these cells respond to, you know, I don't know, a pressure sore versus a burn versus a, you know, a scar that's been excised in the same way? Or are there cues from that surrounding environments that they're actually taking in and using as a part of, you know, kind of a decision process for the biomolecules that they're secreting. Does that make sense? So, yes, it does. And I think yes, because we've seen different response from the mesenchymal stem cells alone when we place them <clears throat> in different types of wounds. And so they have a different response. Now, I don't know whether or not like the combination with the insulin turns them as on as they're going to be on, or if they will continue to respond to the environment. Um, but I know that by themselves, mesenchymal stem cells respond to the environment. By themselves, the insulin secreting cells do not. Um, the ones that we're using, the, the glucose responsive cells did, um, but these constant insulin secreting cells did not. Um, and so I think that the answer is uh, probably. <laughs> but nice. I, I honestly, I, I Welcome to science that. on that score. Yeah. <laughs> we think so. So I think um, this was really fantastic. To be respectful of time, though, I think it's about time to wrap it up. I do apologize to the audience if I didn't ask your specific question. I want to land on this one because it's a question that I was going to ask you anyway. Um, and that is, it seems like you really have something with a lot of applications and the potential for translational value, right? Um, have you thought about that? And where are you in that process? Because as you highlight, this is such an enormous issue in terms of medical costs and, and morbidity, mortality, in terms of complications for people that have diabetes or, you know, as I said, for spinal cord injury that have long-term complications because of something else that's going on in terms of their skin and their wound integrity. Where are you going with that? So we patented it um, because, you know, no, no company is going to spend the money to do clinical trials if they can't uh, if they can't recoup the cost. And I think uh, I wasn't intending on patenting it until a mentor said, you know, if you think it can help people, you have a responsibility to patent it. Otherwise, it will never see patients. So we patented it. Um, we are moving forward with uh, testing in um, the the preclinical phases. And we're moving forward to, because the insulin secreting cells that we're using right now, they're never going to get approval because they're an insulinoma and nobody wants any OMA on themselves. Mm. And so we're looking at ways to create a stable uh, cell line that can transduce, that we'll, we will transduce to release insulin. And we're also looking at um, not necessarily like just changing 
changing either fiberglass or um, or um, zinc stem cells so that they will release the insulin. And we're also looking at just priming these cells in insulin by themselves because it may be that it's not necessary to have this constant insulin. It may be that you soak them in insulin for one night and then the zinc stem cells will be fine and they'll do what we need. And so we're looking at all of those because we know that nobody is going to approve um, an insulinoma. So um, I just want to say you and I should talk because I think I have some connections for you and some good suggestions there. Um, and then just to say thank you so much for really a great evening on behalf of all our attendees. And I hope that um, everyone in your household is feeling better soon. Thank you very much. All right. Thanks to everyone for joining. Good night.